Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. gonna lie they stuck the sound of the cat getting run over in there just for me <laughs> man he is risen <laughs> I love like half of you have no clue what the liturgical response is you're just like that's right he's risen and the other half are like he is risen indeed keep it up well done um, hey I, I don't believe I like I see one or two empty seats here and there um, uh, but There are 401 chairs in this room right now, and uh, you guys packed the house, so well done. In first service, same issue. The real Christians got up. They came at the 8 o'clock service. They were like, gotta check the tomb and stuff. So um, now I know, like, when I say he is risen, there are some people in this room who are like, oh, I know he is. He was leading in worship. I I saw him right up there. That was Jesus. That is not Jesus. That is Jonas. Um, And I'll tell you how I know that. His ears are gauged. Um, So... It's the key difference. Um, first service, he had his hair down. It's like, whoa, he's going to walk on the water. This is awesome. It's going to be a good day. Um, you, need, you need to know something. You've got sort of two options today. And if we can bring the house lights up, because I want to see your faces. Um, so I know who to pick on. Um, uh, I do know Landon's right over here somewhere. So, um, But here's the thing. You've got sort of two choices. You can either help me preach today, because I'm planning on preaching, Um, Or you can just sit there awkwardly while I preach, um, because I have not been more excited about a Sunday than I have this one in quite some time. Over the course of this past week, we have had such a clear sense that God is up to something in this valley and that we get to join him in it. And so um, you got to know, um, there are roughly um, 2.5 billion, say billion, billion, billion Christians in the world. Now, to put that in perspective, that's roughly um, a third of the world's population considers themselves Christian. That is larger than the next three largest religions combined. Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. In, In other words, all over this planet, billions of people believe that the resurrection is reality that Jesus has risen from the dead. And so depending on what tradition you're from in the Christian tradition, you may worship on a different day, but everybody is worshiping what this day represents. They're celebrating what this day represents, that Jesus, the Messiah, rose from the dead. It's happening all over the world right now. You realize that, right? In fact, in Alaska, we're a little late to the party because like on the East Coast, you're like, eh, whatever, we're eating eggs now. Uh, but, but for us, here, here we are, we're gathered together, celebrating something that 2.5 billion people around the world are celebrating. It also, just so you know, somewhere between um, 10,000 and 70,000 of those Christians a year will be killed for their faith. They are so confident that the resurrection is reality that they're willing to die for that belief. Back in 2019, I found myself in Sri Lanka on Palm Sunday with my good friend David Pepper. I believe we have a picture here with Pastor Deshaun Kamratna and some of his staff at People's Church in Colombo, Sri Lanka. 
I preached at his church on Palm Sunday. We went out to eat that afternoon at a restaurant in a hotel called the Cinnamon Grand and then had a few more days together. And then I flew back here to be back in time for our Easter services here. And at 12.03 in the morning, Easter morning, I got the text message from Deshaun that as they gathered together to celebrate the risen Savior, suicide bombers had bombed numerous churches in the city. You probably saw it on the news, devastation. I even saw the hotel, which was primarily filled with Westerners, the restaurant I was eating in, a suicide bomber blew himself up in there. That was Easter 2019. You, you know what they're doing in Sri Lanka today? You know what the church is doing in Sri Lanka today? They're gathering together to celebrate the risen Savior. Because Jesus described an unstoppable kingdom, and that's exactly what it is. It has been, it will be, a kingdom that cannot be stopped. And that's all rooted in this belief that Jesus has risen from the dead. Which brings me to news versus commentary. In case you don't know it, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret um, most of what you hear on TV, if you're watching the news, and it really doesn't matter whether it's coming from the ultra-liberal news network or whether it's coming from the ultra-conservative news network, it doesn't matter whether it's fake news or non-fake news, like, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, most of what you hear is actually commentary, not news. News is just the facts, nothing but the facts, ma'am. Most of what you hear, what people can keep going for 24 hours a day, is their commentary on the news. And the reality is this, and I want you to know this, I just want to lead out with it, because the fact that Jesus lived, that Jesus died, was crucified on a cross, and that the tomb is empty, was a completely accepted fact in history. In fact, when you read the old historians, when you read about them writing about these events, non-Christian historians, they are never disputing whether Jesus lived, whether Jesus was crucified, or whether the tomb is empty. What they're discussing is how those things happened and why those things happened. Happened. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is Flavius Josephus, um, a Jewish historian. He's going to be born within four years of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is the most conservative interpretation of what he wrote. At this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Uh, this historian, Pelagian, uh, wrote in his writing, um, Secular Histories, the Chronicles, um, in the 13th book, just to be specific if you were looking for it. Uh, in the 13th book, he's chronicling um, the Olympiads, and he identifies something that happened during Olympiad 202, which is exactly the day that Jesus dies on the cross. Listen to what he writes. In the fourth year of Olympiad 202, or 37 AD, an eclipse of the sun happened, greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At the sixth hour, day turned into dark night so that the stars were seen in the sky, and an earthquake and Bithynia toppled many buildings of the city of Nicaea. In this moment, this moment that is the moment in which Jesus dies, this secular historian, non-believer, is identifying that there was most certainly an earthquake, and there was most certainly an eclipse of the sun. They're not disputing the facts. They're disputing the reasons. In fact, a guy named Africanus is going to be in an ongoing debate with a guy named Thallus. And as they're in their debate, they are writing back and forth on each other's propositions as to why the sky was darkened, why the earthquake took place, why the tomb is empty. And this is Africanus' response to the claim that Thallus made. At the crucifixion, on the whole world, there pressed a most fearful darkness 
the rocks were rent by an earthquake, and many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in his third book of his histories, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. For the Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the 14th day according to the moon, and the death of the Christ falls on the day before Passover, but an eclipse of the sun takes place only when the moon comes under the sun, and it cannot happen at any other time. Listen to this. Pelagian records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth, manifestly, that one of which we're talking about. Here's what I'm saying. This is all I'm saying. That every newspaper read the same thing the day after the crucifixion and the day after the resurrection. They, they, they read strange earthquake, bizarre eclipse of the sun. After the resurrection, everybody read the same thing. The tomb is empty. They're not debating whether those things are true. They're debating how they happened. I, I would say it like this. If you're still wondering whether Jesus ever lived, whether he died by crucifixion or disappeared from the tomb, you may be on the wrong side of history. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard those things before. I'm just telling you, in antiquity, in ancient writing, they were not debating those things. They were fact. The question was, how did it happen? Why did it happen? So I dare you to follow the facts. But what we're actually really interested in is how can I know truth beyond the facts? How can I move from just having information, just having interest, and actually get an introduction to who Jesus is? Which brings me to totaled. It was February 19th, 2020, about 11.55 a.m. I got the phone call that you never, ever, ever, ever want to get. Fortunately, it was my wife who was calling, and she said these words. She said, we've been in a bad accident. Can you get here as quickly as possible? They were just about five minutes from the house. They had not left all that long ago. They were about five minutes from the house, and so in about 30 seconds, I was there. I guess I got closer to where the accident was, right across from the ball field on Connick. As I got closer to where the accident was, all the cars were lined up, and I just didn't care. I'm like going around them and blazing down the wrong side of the road. And this is the scene that I pull up to. That's our car down in the ditch. A lady had hit a little bit of ice, gotten in those grooves. She came over into my wife's lane head on. In these moments, I can tell you what you're not wondering do you think we can fix the car? Is the car all right? If you were wondering that, you need help. Like, like nobody's thinking about that in this moment. Nobody's thinking about, is my car totaled? Everyone's thinking the same thing in this moment. Is my family okay? Because Kitri and all three of our girls were in the car. As I looked closer at the car, it looked like this next picture it was going to take a little more than some Bondo, I can promise you that. Like, that is not going to pull out. I'll tell you, in, in that moment, I'm not wondering, like, um, all of the other things that are going to come as a result. What are our plans for tomorrow? Where's our bank account at? What doctor do we want to go to long-term? Are there long-term effects? I mean, it's all about this moment right here, right now. But eventually, eventually, the fallout from the wreckage shows up. Eventually, you have to deal with all of those things, all the stuff that comes with the wreckage. And I would just describe it this way. The, the chaos of the crash is often followed by the crisis of the consequences. In the days following the wreck, the question becomes, so what now? What's next? What can be salvaged out of this mess? What could be redeemed out of all this? How long will restoration take? Is this hopeless? Will I ever feel the same again after my concussion? Is it over? Can this broken thing be mended? Can it be restored? Could this dead thing live again? What does restoration look like? For us, for me, 
in my situation. My grandfather had this 1966 Chevy short wide with the big back glass inline six. In fact, it looked almost identical to this one when my dad first gave it to me. I was far too young to know what I had at the time, but I figured the chrome on the side needs to go, and gray is not a great color, and it needs some big tires, and since, of course, I'm a professional car painter, not, I thought, I can do this with a can of spray paint and some Bondo, and so I went at it. I tried, I really, but it was so bad, like so bad. In fact, at some point I was like, this is hopeless, and, and I was going to move to Alaska, and so I, I sold it. And I have regretted that decision from 1991 till now. Like, I'd love to have that. If you're watching online, and you were in Oklahoma, and you bought a 1966 <laughs> Chevy short ride that looked terrible, like with black primer paint on it and pink on the Chevy thing on the back, Give me a call. We'll see what we can work out. Like, I've wanted that truck back ever since then. And the reality is that if I actually wanted that track, truck back now, if it ever showed up now, it would not cost the same as I sold it for back then. In fact, I had to sell the truck and one of my horses in order to buy an old Jeep CJ7 that I could drive up the Alcan to Alaska so that I could move up here back then. The reality is that once we lose something, if we want it back, we have to redeem it. We have to repurchase it. We have to pay a price to actually get that thing back. And in case you missed the memo, in case you weren't here for our Good Friday service, what we discovered at our Good Friday service is that Good Friday is good before Sunday ever shows up. And in fact, Good Friday is good all by itself because Good Friday is the day that the price is paid and redemption is made possible. And you can't start restoration until there's redemption. And so the death on the cross represents that. Redemption is a reality, but the redemption on the cross was simply a necessary prelude to what Jesus was truly interested in, restored relationship. He didn't die to start a religion. He laid his life down so that you could have relationship. And inside of relationship with Jesus, anything is possible, even resurrection. Just ask Lazarus if you'd like some proof of life. Let me give you a little bit of context to the story of Lazarus. Spoiler alert, if you don't know the story, he's Lazarus. But, but let me give you a little bit of context to the story because Jesus is actually already good friends with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. We only have one other account of when he stopped by their house with his disciples, but it is such an intimate account. He's in their home, they're eating together, they're celebrating together, he's teaching there, they're sitting at his feet, but there's a relationship that exists and beyond a relationship that exists, there's real affection there for Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So John chapter 11, in light of that, listen to verses 1 through 6. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. So the two sisters sent, message to, sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Now listen to this. Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus so because, therefore, in light of this fact that he loved them, he stayed where he was for two more days. You've been there before, haven't you? Hey, Lord, we need some help around here. Like, I need to get a memo to you, and I need you to get a ticket, and I need you to show up here ASAP because my situation is dire. The circumstance is beyond my control, and if you don't show up, we don't have any hope of rescue. Jesus, would you come? And it's like crickets. It's within reason sometimes that he loves you so much 
that he's going to wait. That's frustrating. It's alarming. It's disturbing, to be quite honest. And yet in this moment, in light of his deep affection for Lazarus, his deep affection for Mary and for Martha, he is going to postpone answering the call. He's going to do this, though, for a very specific reason. And I want to give you a little bit of context because it's going to put this story in a brand new light for you like it did for me. According to Jewish teaching, Jewish tradition, there was this idea that the soul of a person after they had died would linger in the tomb with the body for three days. And at the end of three days, the soul would then depart and leave the body. In fact, you can find it in um, what's referred to as the Genesis Rabbah. It's um, it's this uh, commentary on the book of Genesis. And so in chapter 100, verse 7, this is what it says. The very height of mourning is not until the third day. For three days, the spirit wanders about the tomb, wondering if it might return into the body. Then it hovers no more, but leaves the body to itself. In fact, they had very specific practices when it came to um, ceremonial burial. First of all, the person must be buried within 24 hours on the same day, if at all possible, but they weren't wasting any time. The body needs to be placed in the ground ASA. And then they would assign watchers or observers to the grave. They would come every day for one really specific reason. In fact, it's recorded like this in the Smakat. It says, um, during the first three days, medical experts or experts return to the cemetery and examine the dead to determine whether they are really dead. They have stories about going back during those three days and finding that there were some people not dead. They were like, mostly dead, um, bring out your dead. Like, and, and, but after day three, don't even bother. Three days, the soul lingers, and then it departs. And three days, go back and check. But after that, it's no longer necessary. The belief was that decay had begun then. It had moved beyond death to decomposition. Now, Jesus, just to be clear, before this event ever happens, Jesus has already raised two people from the dead. He, he raised uh, the widow's son, the widow of Nain. They were having a funeral procession. This would be epic. They're having a funeral procession, and on their way out of the city, Jesus reaches over, touches him, and ta-da, he's back. And then Jairus' daughter, by the time Jesus gets to the house, she has already died, and Jesus brings her back to life as well. But here's what you need to know. Both of those incidents happened on the first day. They happened before the bodies were put in the ground. They happened soon enough in their mind. This is an entirely different situation. John 11, verse 17, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Dang it. So close. Jesus probably got a little confused in his calendar. He's like, I booked several other things. I thought I was going to get here on day three, but I didn't make it on day three. So now the soul has left and the body is decomposing. Now, you got to understand, Jesus deliberately waits for this moment because he is making a declaration here. But listen to what Martha has to say. Verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. You've felt that before, haven't you? Like, if you had just shown up, my marriage wouldn't be over. If you had just shown up in time, Jesus, if you had gotten your ticket and you had gotten here, but no, you need to wait a couple more days. If you had just been here, he wouldn't be dead now. But now, now it's been four days. Now, it's hopeless. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. 
Right, 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 right. Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. I believe your words, Jesus. I believe what you've said. I know there will be a resurrection from the dead, but that's going to be in the last day, and I want my brother right now. I want it to happen right now. And Jesus told her, Oh, sister, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. It's almost as if she's like, wow, whatever. I'm not here for riddles. Verse 28, then she returned to Mary and called her aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and wants to see you. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if I... Only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, if you had just shown up in time, I know you can do it, but now you're too late. If you had just shown up in time. If you don't know anything about um, Jewish culture when it comes to either celebration or to mourning, they are experts. Like, it, it doesn't matter. I've been in Israel at both, and when there is a celebration, you are dragged into it. Like, it is so exuberant. And when there is mourning, there are actually rules written for how you are to mourn. There are actually professional mourners that you can hire who will come to your event and wail with you. Instructions like, tearing your clothes and throwing dirt in the air. It's this vibrant expression of emotion. Get it all out. A lot like the way we mourn in America. (laughs) Listen to what it says. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. I've felt that. Like, I don't think Jesus is angry at Mary, and I don't think he's angry at the people mourning. I think Jesus is angry at unbelief. I think Jesus is angry at death. I think Jesus is angry at hopelessness. I think Jesus is angry when people who say they believe in him don't believe he can do anything that he says that he can do, and I've felt that before. Like, over the last nine years, there have been some situations where I'm just like, do we not believe? Like, I know a lot of believers who don't believe that Jesus could resurrect their situation. And I think often it makes him mad at hell and it makes him mad as. And in this moment, he's described as anger welling up in him. He's deeply troubled. This past week, as we were praying for this Sunday and praying for our church and praying for the future and praying for the gospel in the valley, as we were praying this past Monday, I had such a clear sense from the Lord. He's saying this, Jonathan, I dare my church to believe me again. I'm so sick of hearing people who say they believe in Jesus but don't actually believe that he can resurrect dead things, that he can breathe life into lost things, that he can bring the hopeless hope or that he could restore the broken. He's saying, I'm daring my church to believe for the miraculous again. John 11, verse 34 Jesus, with this indignation, he's like, well, where have you put him? He asked them, and they told him, Lord, come and see. Verse 39, Jesus gets there, and he says, roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell is going to be horrific. You're going to wish you had COVID and you could not. Like, it is so bad in there, Jesus. You don't want to roll that stone away. Leave it right where it is. And Jesus responded, didn't I tell you? I don't know how many times I've heard that from him. Like, Jesus, you can't imagine how bad it's in there. 
Like, you can't imagine how bad this situation is. I don't have a clue what to do about it. You can't imagine how bad it is in here. Like, it stinketh, to use good King James. Like, you don't want to go in there, Jesus. And he responds, didn't I tell you that if you would just believe, you would see God's glory? He's saying, I double dog dare you to believe. But Jesus, you, you don't know. If you'd only come a little sooner, it might be able to be mended or restored or repaired. But it's too late now. I'm sure of that, Jesus. You don't know how bad it is in there. You don't know how hard it is, Jesus. You don't know how scared I am. It's too late. It's day four and decay is already set in. And Jesus just says, didn't I tell you? Just believe, trust me. John eleven forty one. so they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I love the rest of this verse because um, it says, thank you for hearing me. He said this out loud for everyone else's sake. I only say this so that they all know that I'm talking to you and you're talking to me and that this is coming from you when all is said and done. But nevertheless, thank you for hearing me. And then Jesus looks into the darkness. He looks into the tomb. And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus! Get your honey out here now. It's like, like when my, he's, he's indignant. He's like, I can't believe, I hate death. I hate hell. I hate the grave. I hate decay. And I hate the unbelief that captures my people's hearts. Lazarus, it had been like my mom, she was in first service. I apologize to her because I wore my Talkeetna tuxedo instead of really dressing up. And my mom, when she gets mad at me and she uses all three names, right? Jonathan Christian Walker, you get in here right now. You know she's serious. Jesus is serious in this moment. He is not messing around. He's making a declaration that when you believe it's hopeless, when you believe it's day four, he can still kick open the door and he can bring restoration and reconciliation and wholeness and wellness to your situation. Do you believe it, he says? Oh, come on. You're going to make me do this by myself all day? All right, here we go. Just me and you, Jesus. And the dead man came out his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth, and Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Like, I don't know about you, but when I see the miraculous happen, I sort of like, Duh. right? Like, oh, what? And that's where everyone's at in this moment. And Jesus is like, this isn't finished. Get that stuff off of him. Take all those old trappings away. Get that stuff that's holding him back and binding him up out of the way because I've set him free. And if I've set him free, then he is free indeed. Yeah. Get to work and let him go. Man, you're going to need to stand up now. Go ahead, stand up with me because I've got some questions for you. You ready for this? Here's what Jesus is declaring. If he has authority over death and decay, then could you tell me again what he can't do? Jesus is saying, I dare you to show me a life that is too broken, an atheist who is too smart, a wound that is too deep, a heart that is too hard, an addiction that's too strong, or a person that's too old, or a life that's too wasted. I dare you to show it to me because I've restored all of those before and I will do it again. John 11, verse 45, many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but some went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So from that time on, the Jewish leaders began to plot Jesus' death. <laughs> Listen. 
They begin to plot Jesus' death. We're told later they also begin to plot Lazarus' death. You know, the guy who was just raised from the dead? And you can almost hear it in the text in this moment. Jesus just saying, oh, bring it. Like, I, I dare you. No, 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 I double dare. No, no, I double dog dare. No, no, I triple dog dare you to crucify me. <laughs> Listen, I've seen so much wreckage over the past nine years. Over my lifetime in ministry, I've seen so many broken situations, so much adultery and abuse and addiction and abandonment, the devastation brought by destructive choices. And this is why today matters. This is why the resurrection of Jesus actually matters because this same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead also raised himself from the dead. And if he ain't dead, then he ain't done bringing resurrection life to situations. You understand what that means? That if Jesus is actually alive, then Jesus isn't finished. He's still raising dead things to life. He's still restoring relationships and mending brokenness and severing addiction. Jesus, if he's alive, is still at work. And you got to know this. I have seen with my own eyes more Lazarus situations than you can imagine that have encountered a resurrected Savior. And maybe your situation needs that encounter. I'm telling you, everything from the person who was standing here doing the spoken word to dozens of people I personally know in this room have experienced the resurrection power of Jesus in their life. Because if he's not dead, then he's not done. I've seen the hopeless find hope. I've seen the hateful find happiness. I've seen the hurt made whole. I've seen the addict set free. I've seen the lost brought home. I've seen the angry put at peace. And I've seen the doubter doing miracles. And if that's you in this room, could you just throw your hand up real high? Like I've had a Lazarus situation in my life and I've met the resurrected savior. I look around this room and I see some of you and I know your story. And I'm just telling you, if you're still wondering if it's real, it is. And it's for you. And it's for me. And it's for right now. Right here. I can only imagine from Jesus' perspective what is really meant in Hebrews chapter 12. It describes us being surrounded in heaven, like looking down, watching us, this great cloud of witnesses, like this 2.5 billion people, uh, these people who have experienced persecution, who have died for their faith in Jesus, the early disciples, and they're sort of surrounding this arena, and they're watching us, and they're cheering for us. And, and it says that because of that cloud of witnesses, in light of that fact, let us run. Like, why don't you throw off all the old grave clothes? Why don't you get rid of all that stuff that's holding you back and run with endurance the race that is set before us? Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame of the cross and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is risen, and if he is risen, He's not done. What we're going to do is we're going to move into some celebration, and we're going to do some things a little bit different today, but I, I just want to say this to those of you in this room, because I don't think it really matters whether you've professed faith at some point in Jesus or not, or whether you've never professed faith in Jesus. What really matters is this moment, what really matters is where are you at right now? And I would just say, if, the, if you're ready, if you're ready to get out of your tomb of fear, to get out of your tomb of rejection, to get out of your tomb of guilt, your tomb of shame, Jesus is standing and he's saying, come out, get up already. I've already made it possible. And what I desire is that you would experience real relationship with me. I didn't come to establish a religion. I came to create the possibility for restoration to relationship 
with my kids. Get up. Get out. I have come to set you free from everything that has you bound. And so we're going to begin singing. And today what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate baptisms just during worship. We did this in first service. We had like negative two people signed up for baptism when the service started. Ten people, dads and their children, moms, husbands and wives climbed in just to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. And I can't think, and here's why, I can't think of a better day than today to get baptized because literally this is what baptism represents, that I have been buried with Jesus and raised up brand new, resurrected life, eternal. And if you are making a decision right now to follow Jesus, I wanna surrender. I wanna come out of my tomb of shame and of guilt and of abandonment and of rejection and all the things, addiction, everything that's held me back. I want to experience resurrection life in Jesus. As we begin to sing, I want you to leave this room and go into the foyer. In fact, if you already signed up for baptisms, you can take off right now because you don't need to hear this. That's about eight of you in here or 10. Go ahead and head right out there. But if you're making a decision today to follow Jesus, baptism is a public profession of a personal decision. It's simply you saying to everyone else, I choose Jesus. He's already chosen you. He's already laid down his life. He's already come back to life. And if he's not dead, then he's not done. And the opportunity is present for you here and now. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play. Thank you.